Hello and welcome to Being Well, I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened before, welcome back. As we've explored previously many times on the podcast, a big part of human nature is our tendency to rapidly sort people into two different groups, like me and not like me. This tendency moves us to gravitate toward people we perceive as like me and avoid, even oppose, people we perceive as not like me. We use many different kinds of markers to determine which group a person belongs to, markers like their perceived race, gender, political affiliation, and even social class. But there's an often overlooked factor that might influence how we view ourselves and others even more powerfully, the way we speak. Today, we're going to be exploring something that we often don't even think about, how our speech shapes our social identity and the views we hold about other people. To help us do that, I'm joined by a pioneering, truly psychologist in this territory, Dr. Katherine Kinsler. Dr. Kinsler is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the leader of the Development of Social Cognition Laboratory. Her work focuses on the origins of prejudice and in-group, out-group thinking, with an emphasis on understanding how language and accent mark different social groups. She holds degrees from Yale and Harvard, was a Fulbright scholar, and was named one of the 50 most influential scientists under the age of 40 by the World Economic Forum. She's also the author of the wonderful book, if you're watching this on video, you can see it there behind her, How You Say It, Why You Talk the Way You Do, and What It Says About You. And her work appears regularly in the New York Times and other major media outlets. So Catherine, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy that we're doing this. I've been looking forward to this conversation. This is a topic that I admittedly don't know a lot about, but I've been very interested in what I have read about it, including through your work. Um, and that work focuses on a lot of different big ideas, how we acquire language, how our language can influence our view of the world, uh, the influence of being multilingual is something that you've explored a bit. And what I'd really like to focus on here today is how language can shape our identity, both our own and how we perceive other people. So maybe just starting there, why is language and particularly dialect uh, such an important signifier of identity? And what are a few examples of this? Thanks. You know, I love the way that you set this up, that we think about mm. social groups all the time, right? So you think about yeah. race and gender and any group, you know, you, we can start to identify people and care about groups in so many different ways. And we're often just not thinking about language in that way. Um, so I think we often think about language as a way to communicate content, but not necessarily that the way we're speaking and the dialect or accent that we're using or the particular language that we grew up speaking, how that impacts how we perceive others and how other people perceive us. Um, and, you know, Language is funny in that when we speak, it, you might say something about your current social group, right? So the way you're speaking is going to reflect your social identity and your language can change throughout your life. At the same time, in many ways, the way that you speak is really reflecting the voices that you heard when you were a child. So because of that, I think it can be this incredibly powerful signal of your native identity. And then that can be used, you know, for good or misused sometimes. Yeah. As a as a kind of framing question here associated with that, you just mentioned something that I think is really important, which is that the language that we're speaking, or maybe as you're saying, the way that we're speaking it even more so, uh, is an indicator of the people that you grew up with. I don't know if you're comfortable uh, speaking to this from a research standpoint, but just like out of curiosity, why does the brain tend to attach so strongly to whether somebody is speaking with like a New York accent versus a Southern accent versus something else entirely? Like, why do we care about that so much? So, you know, it's one of the most fascinating findings in this, I think, are that we have a what people sometimes call a close to home advantage in dialect recognition. And so I think it makes sense when you think about it, right? So if you grew up, say, um, in New York, you might be able to differentiate a New York accent from a Boston accent from somebody from the American South. Um, whereas, you know, speaking as somebody who grew up in the East Coast of the US, I hear a bunch of different accents from the UK and they sound kind of hard to me to disentangle, right? You know, I can say British in some way, but it's but it's hard for me to know exactly what it means. Um, whereas if you live in the UK, you have all of these kinds of cultural and sociolinguistic stereotypes about different people. 
So what I take from that is that this close to home advantage, it's kind of this idea that we detect social differences that are socially useful in our lives. And so, you know, picking out who's from around here and who's not, the way you speak can basically instantly suggest to somebody else whether, you know, we come from the, you know, we have similar experiences versus we don't. Um, and so in some ways, and, you know, also it might be seen as giving some real information about who you are and where you came from. You might be able to guess, say, where somebody grew up. Um, but also there are so many cultural stereotypes that we have about different groups of speakers. And so often those are evoked and we don't even realize it. So you might think, oh, this person just sounds a little bit nice or smart or tall or whatever it is. And it's actually the cultural stereotype coming through and not really any signal in their voice. So you just gave a couple of positive indicators there, or like what culturally we generally frame as positive indicators, nice, smart, and interestingly tall, which might seem like an outlier, but I, I, I think it's definitely in the mix. What are some of the dialects that we tend to place those positive indicators on, maybe for English speakers here or American English speakers here in particular? Yeah. So I actually, you know, the, the, the inclusion of tall was not an accident. Um, yeah. So, cause I think it's pretty interesting because it's something that you wouldn't think your judgments, guessing somebody's height would depend on the dialect or language they spoke. Right. You might say, oh, maybe a deeper voice is a larger person. Right. You might have some sort of inkling of um, an idea like that, but you probably wouldn't think that on average English speakers sound taller than French speakers say. Um, and except that is what some research has found. And so, you know, some of the seminal studies in this were conducted in Canada in the 1960s when there was a lot of language politics. Um, and so people would explicitly say things like they thought that English speaker, English speaking and French speaking Canadians uh, should be treated equal and, you know, this kind of egalitarian bilingual society. But then researchers developed um, what they called a matched guys technique. And so what you do is you play a group of, part of naive participants, the same person, say speaking in English or in French or in different accents or dialects of English. And they would say things like, oh, well, you know, that first voice, that first person just sounds a bit nicer and smarter and taller than the second person, but unbeknownst to participants, it was actually the same person producing both voices. And so you can see these cultural stereotypes, you know, just really leaking into your judgments of somebody. And you think you know somebody and their personality when you hear them speak. But a lot of that could be some sort of, you know, broader cultural attitudes that you have that you might not even always be aware of. Yeah. So what you're referring to here is this very, very quick process that's happening, I would imagine, largely subconsciously inside of the brain, inside of something's going on in our cognition, where we're moving people into different kinds of groups. We're moving them into, uh, to grossly oversimplify, kind of good groups and bad groups of different kinds, or groups we have positive judgments about, groups we have negative judgments about, to maybe put it a little bit more cleanly. Do we have a good understanding of why the brain cares so much about putting people into categories in the first place to kind of yeah. zoom out a little bit mm -hmm. here? Yeah, it's great. And one thing I would add to that, though, just before we we zoom out is you can also have a mixed group. So, you know, going back to that idea of, you know, that idea of someone who's smarter and nicer, often you find these kind of splits in in thinking about warmth and confidence, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can almost yeah. have this like, oh, you know, I like her, but but I don't think she's that competent. Or, you know, yeah, so you can yeah. see these kind of mixed social assessments. But, you know, more generally, um, why do we care? And loosely, as you say, you know, have these good groups and bad groups or sometimes mixed groups. Um, you know, what's that based on? Well, I think that, you know, from a bigger picture sense, where does this come from and where does it come from in development? So I'm trained as a developmental psychologist and where does this come from in development? And my bigger picture answer to that is that we're really set up to categorize things in general. So categorization is a really fundamental aspect of our cognition. So, you know, imagine I'm, si I'm seated on a chair right now. You can't see it, but I am. Um, and imagine that I encountered some new chair in a new place and I had absolutely no idea what it was and I wasn't sure it was going to support my weight. And so I test out every chair to make sure it's really a chair like I think it is, right? That's just a really slow way to live. So I have a category in my mind and I think chair and there's another one and I infer that it's also going to support me if I sit on it. So, 
you know, this makes sense for how we learn about things and how we learn language. And it would be impossible to function in the world without categories. Um, so then we apply them to people. Um, and so, you know, kids are sort of these intuitive sociologists trying, you know, using those basic category skills to divide the world into people and to figure out who's like them. And early on, that might have some sort of safety significance if you're thinking about sort of a long term evolutionary account that somebody who's like you, close to you, kinship, that kind of stuff. Um, but then I think we misuse that all the time. Um, and also when we're categorizing people where kids are on the lookout for what are those positive categories? What are those negative categories? So I learned that my culture values this kind of person, this way of speaking, this way of looking and so forth. And that's where you can get xenophobic and racist and other kinds of prejudice attitudes that are really quickly applied to one of those categories that the kid's creating. To highlight something that you're saying here, my admittedly very limited understanding, so please, you know, clarify here for me, of early language acquisition is that, as with most skills, the brain is essentially turbocharged during early childhood. And we're really, really good at learning languages when we're young, and then we kind of pretty rapidly lose that ability as we age. And particularly if you're an adult, you've run into this problem. I uh, I, I learned a second language a little bit when I in middle school and high school. I found it hard but doable. And today, returning to that as a 33-year-old, I'm finding immensely challenging. Um, so the brain is just a lot more plastic when we're a lot younger. Uh, but something of yours that I read that really fascinated me is that, to paraphrase a little bit, when we're a kid, we're not just learning the mechanics of a language, we're taking in the social meaning of a language. Uh, the different ways that speaking can tell us things about the people around us and the groups that they belong to. So you've actually conducted some pretty cool research on this, and I'd just love to learn more about it. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I think that you're right that it's so... No, so I'm really pro-language learning as an adult. So I'm glad that you're yeah. doing it as a 33-year-old. You know, I think <laughs> well, that that's you. wonderful. And so I don't, I certainly don't want people to take from this um, that you shouldn't learn languages later on, because a lot of learning language is about connecting with people and learning new things, right? And we can do that as adults and that's wonderful. Um, but as you said, kids are just much better at learning languages. And in particular, you know, adults can often get really good at the grammar and the vocabulary of a language. Perhaps their grammar may not be perfect. You might make subtle mistakes or, you know, not have quite a, as quick an ear as a native would be, but you can get pretty good. But it is tremendously difficult to master a non-native sounding accent as an adult, such that, right? So you're always going to kind of stand out as somebody who didn't learn this as a child. Um, whereas children have this just remarkable ability to learn languages. And I think what comes along with this in some of my studies is an ability to see language as marking social life early in development. So, you know, back to that kind of why do we care about who's native, young kids prefer native sounding people. And in some of my studies, they want to learn from them, um, approach them, trust them, these kinds of measures. And as they get older, I think that persists, but I also think kids start to attend more to kind of broader cultural stereotypes where you're going to pick up on status and what your society sees as valued and then attaching those to different ways of speaking too. Focusing on the primacy of language inside of this kind of social evaluation process that you're speaking to here, like who do I want to attach to? Who do I want to find some distance from? Uh, one of the things that I read in your book that just totally blew my mind um, was the value that kids place on, I'm, I may or may not butcher this, but essentially spoken accent versus the visual depiction of race signals and how there was like a stronger association with spoken accents, so much so that uh, there was some misidentifications of what somebody would look like when they grew up based on that. So would you mind talking about that for a second? Sure, yeah. So, you know, one sad but reliable finding in social development research is that by around the age of five or so, white kids in the U.S. often express a preference for other white children. Um, 
And so, you know, that's something that comes out in the literature. I think that, you know, a lot of people are becoming aware of this and trying to take steps, right, you know, to to correct the kinds of attitudes kids are learning, um, you know, but uh, this is something that that is, has been observed for a long time in research studies like this. Um, but I also think that when a kid is expressing a race-based preference, it's reflecting attitudes they're learning from society, certainly. But I also think it's not the same as a racist attitude in an adult or an older child necessarily, that they're still learning and they might still be malleable were they to live in a world that expressed fewer racial biases to them, you know? So in some of my studies with kids, I've put kids in a situation, say, take that, you know, hypothetical white five, you know, five-year-old kindergarten age kid and ask them to pick, say, who do you like and show them an array of white and black faces. Um, and so, you know, on this kind of task, these white kids very reliably pick other white faces, um, replicating past results. And then we can ask them, you know, questions about who do you like more between two people who speak, one who speaks in a native familiar accent and one who speaks in a foreign accent in English. Um, and they say that they like the native accented people. Um, another thing to know about five-year-old kids is they don't have a lot of motivation to control their prejudice. And so unlike adults, you know, there's experimental <laughs> designs or kids, you can just, you know, ask them what they think. Whereas with adults, you might need a more clever, implicit measure to yeah. figure out their, you know, their true beliefs. Um, totally. So... But then when we put kids in a situation where they're asked, these white five-year-old kids, where they're asked to pick, say, would you rather, you know, would you rather play with somebody who speaks in a native accent yet is of a different race versus somebody who shares your racial group, but speaks in a foreign accent, you know, you start to see that in, in some of my studies that accent matters more to kids than race early in life. Um, and what I take from that, you know, it's interesting because sometimes parents have a kid in this study and they feel really relieved because it's sort of like, oh, my kid's not, you know, being as racist as I thought, which on the one hand, of course, like there is something, you know, positive about that. But also I think we're just not aware of how kids can express these really strong accent-based preferences. And sometimes parents will have the intuition like, well, my kid's just learning language. That's great. Um, and the thing is, though, that as we get into a as we get into older childhood and adulthood, this preference for native over, say, a less familiar accent or dialect, um, yet that you can perfectly well understand, is one that can really drive a lot of uh, preferences for some people over other and prejudices. Um, and one other study you mentioned about. Um, kids thinking about people as they grow up, we took those same um, five-year-old kids and they're asked to predict who somebody would grow up to be. So kind of predicting, say you see this, you know, uh, a child who is white and speaks in English, who is she going to grow up to be? And they're more likely to predict that uh, kids will grow up to keep their language than they are to grow up to have um to have a similar look, have a similar looking racial group membership. And so, you know, these kids have this prediction that your language is so stable, it's going to stay with you, even if it means really transforming physical appearance. Now, something I'll note on that is that we actually find a really big difference there between white kids in the U.S. and African-American kids, um, where the Black children seem to know a lot more about race early in development. And then there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, white kids are thinking less about race, uh, perhaps because they don't uh, they don't need to, you know, in their in their lives that if you're, you know, if you're not as likely to face uh, discrimination in your life, then it's something you're not thinking about as much. Wow, that's completely fascinating. I did not know that. Um completely consistent with what I would kind of imagine if you thought about it deeply. Are there any, uh, man, we might be like a little bit too early stage with some of this work to have a great sense for this, but are there any early interventions that people are thinking about in terms of, of helping kids develop more awareness about this or, geez, helping adults develop yeah. more awareness about this, <laughs> but we might as well start with the malleable kids yeah. and see if we could get somewhere there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is such a hot topic in research and education right now. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that in a few years there'll be even better answers. Um, you know, one answer that I find uh, fairly compelling is um, 
is thinking about the language that adults use with kids to set up categories. So, um, you know, I'll give you an example from this is thinking about uh, thinking about gender. So it's pretty common if you go to a preschool classroom, you hear things like boys and girls line up. Um, you know, I have a one-year-old and a seven-year-old and I take into the playground and, you know, it's just everyone talks about everyone else's gender all the time. It's like the first thing you remark on for a kid, if you're talking about other kids, right? So it's just like really common in the discourse. So uh, researchers have looked at what happens in a classroom where the teachers just purposefully talk about gender more than they were before. Now, it doesn't have any positive or negative content. It's just using the category more. So it's like, you know, boys and girls line up. Let's put boys art over here. Girls, can you do this before snack time and so forth, stuff like this. Um, and what they find is that after exposure to increasing the category that um, that kids then start to think things like, well, only girls can be nurses and only boys uh, can be scientists. And teachers never say anything about nursing or science, um, but what they're doing is kind of amplifying the category. And then kids, you know, you can see the little wheels turning, thinking something like, well, everyone's talking about this category. So it must be really important. And so now I'm going to look out in the world and kind of fill in my stereotypes with other stuff. And then what you find out in the world is not so great. So I do think that's something people are thinking about is the amount of conversation we have. And it doesn't have to be just about gender, um, how that impacts the development of categorization. Now, there's a flip side to this, because when you think about race, um, historically, a lot of white parents in the U.S. have had the approach of what people call colorblind parenting. So in an effort to raise kids who weren't racist, they just didn't talk about it. Um, and, you know, it seems that does not work um, because kids are paying attention to the world and they're cultural sponges and not talking about something doesn't make it go away, right? Um, and so, you know, I think what's important there, and I do think research is still really active in this area in that you want to be able to talk to kids about uh, discrimination and about uh, historic patterns of prejudice. And you want to do so in a way that I think really highlights um, the situational variables and not something that makes kids think, well, you know, people like this just must be better than people, you know, from this other group. And so it's complicated, but one tool that I think is really effective is talking about people as individuals, more as individuals and less as members of a group. Um, and so I think the more we can do that in life, the better it is. To spend 15 seconds, hopefully on something, which is a favorite pet topic of mine, I mentioned in the, on the podcast over and over again, um, cognitive biases have a huge role to play in this. Like you're basically speaking to the fundamental attribution error there where we're ascribing to a categorical difference as opposed to a situational difference. So the more attentive we can be to those situational differences, the the better our chances are of raising, you know, reasonably egalitarian children. Although, you know, that's a that's a tough hill to climb mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so, right. Yeah. So one of the things that you were saying earlier is how kids have this very fixed view of dialect, uh, you know, extremely, extremely fixed is in some cases, maybe particularly in the case of children who are raised in more white environments. But we know that people change their identity a lot as they move through life. They join different social groups, they move from one part of the country to the other, and so on. Are there ways in which our speaking style changes as we do this? Like, does it change along with our identity? It does. And so, you know, and I think this is one of the coolest things about language. And you really can think of language in two ways. So one is this kind of, you know, you're forever marked by your native tongue. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? That um, there's all this research about, you know, thinking in a native language versus a second language can be different, right? Um, and as we talked about, it's so much easier to learn a language or an accent early in life um, at the same time, you know, so that's maybe the bigger picture settings, like which language am I going to learn? Um, that's going to depend on which languages I'm exposed to mostly early on. Um, but then when you think about more, you know, fine grain settings, there's so much variability across our lifespans. And so you can see these fascinating examples um, of people who, you know, as you said, you move, you are from the South and you go to college in the North or vice versa. Um, you have a new social identity and a new group of people. And then all of a sudden the way that you speak sounds different. Um, 
you, you know, there's also kind of the flip side of you feel self-conscious about the way you speak and you try to really feel motivated to change it around other people, which may not be fair. Um, but some people feel that, you know, we often talk about it as linguistic insecurity. And so all, you know, this can all shift throughout your life. And I think language can be this tremendous source of connection for people. So even just, you know, two people hanging out, you like each other. Linguists can study your speech and find that your vowels just get a little bit kind of closer together and how they sound. And so it really happens moment to moment and it can be the source of connection. And that's a largely subconscious process. Are there, are there, I mean, I'm sure that there are examples of people trying to change how they talk to fit in. We talk about code switching, things like that. Um, but it's mostly unconscious, right? There, I love the example of politicians. And so sometimes, you know, you can find these like mashups on YouTube of a given politician, you know, sounding Texan here and, you know, completely East Coast here and this sort of thing. And then, you know, it's sort of seen as this like really, you know, disingenuous political maneuvering. Um, and who am I to say who's coached on what? So like, sure, maybe there's <laughs> some, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that all politicians have like no, you know, no traces of disingenuous speech changing. Um, but I do think that people in general change their voices to match their audiences, right? And there's some suggestions that people who might be a little bit more open or empathic might, you know, personality wise might do that even more. And so I think it's largely unconscious. I think if somebody feels like you're trying to do it on purpose, it probably doesn't serve the same social function as if it really is an authentic process. So I mentioned a phrase there a second ago that I realized that we might want to unpack a little bit for the for the audience. It's code switching. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, some people will have, say, two different uh, dialects that they speak in different contexts. Um, and so, you know, one one example you might hear about a lot in the U.S. would be um, Black Americans uh, who speak African American English at home, and uh, you know linguists often say, or you know people often say, standard American English. Although I do think, just as a note, I think right there's something it feels really uncomfortable to there, call there's one. There's something problematic. Yeah, there's about something that, yeah, problematic. Totally. You know, so we could call it you know SAE to get away from the use you know standard, but. Um, so uh, so this is an example. And I think that code switching, you know, all of our language is about the social life that we're in. So we use language to socially connect with other people. If we're in a social situation that, you know, doesn't, re that requires one language or one connection, you know, that's what we produce. And so I think people very naturally switch between different uh communities and different ways of feeling. You can imagine a bilingual speaker who has two really different language contexts, right? And you just naturally and seamlessly switch between them or sometimes even mix them depending on the social context you're in. And so I think that works really well and it speaks to this idea of language and culture. Now, I think the problem arises is when society layers this value on top of one of uh, the languages and not the other, right? And so if, you know, you're speaking a certain dialect in school because you're taught that your dialect at home is wrong or bad or just like not as good, that that can just be incredibly uh, painful and unfair to children and to adults and to language because all dialects are able to express all aspects of human thought. There's no right or wrong way of speaking. Um, and so I think that, you know, kind of recognizing the value and the authenticity and the dignity of all languages is a really good thing. So we're beginning to wander into a conversation that's basically about prejudice and the ways that we hold different views about different language groups um, and different dialectical groups in particular. And uh, you used an example there of African-American vernacular English, uh, however you want to refer to it, um, and that being a dialect that tends to be a magnet for people's prejudices of various kinds, due probably to a lot of the social constructs that we have about Black people in the United States and the judgments and discriminations that people easily attach to that racial group. Uh, in the research, maybe using that as an example, what are some of the consequences that get associated with this sort of linguistic prejudice? So, you know, one consequence, I think, is that people aren't aware that they're doing it. 
So I, I don't know. Is that a cause or a consequence? I'm not sure, but <laughs> I'll, I'll go with it. So um, starts to, starts to merge together at yeah, a certain point. Yeah. But I think that you know we have this kind of confused view about communication more generally where we often think that communication and comprehension is really objective. So it's like, I said my thing in the world, I did a good job, now it's out there, I'm done. But that's not how communication works. It's actually reciprocal. And so the listener plays this huge part in how a communication unfolds. Um, And I think with this example you gave of uh, the intersection between race and language, you get people who think something along the lines of the following. I'm not racist, you know, it's just, I I don't think that person was a good communicator. So I I didn't understand them very well. This is just me using my, you know, objective communication assessment hat. And I've decided this person is like not very good at speaking. And so, you know, I don't want to hire them or whatever other kind of judgment you're making. Um, And I, the problem of course, is that linguistic prejudice can reveal a really insidious aspect of racism because you think you're just evaluating communication, but then all of these studies show how much our assessment of whether or not someone's a good communicator, whether or not we understood something, how we respond in a conversation, you know, all of that impacts somebody's ability to communicate. And so you can really just have something that's prejudiced, but you think you're just responding based on an assessment of communication. So you feel okay about it. Um, And so that I think is a really uh, something that's, you know, really important for people to think more about. And I think once people are aware of that, they often kind of see it in their own lives and think, oh yeah, you know, I'd never thought of it that way, but I understand it when now I do. Yeah, no, totally. And to kind of explore some of the other research findings inside of this territory, there's a certain, there's some pretty good evidence. And again, correct me if I'm wrong here, you're much more familiar with this than I am, is that people actually tend to like stop trying to understand somebody when they're hearing words in a dialect that they don't comprehend as well. Even when adults are perfectly capable of understanding speech that's in a non-native or foreign, unfamiliar dialect, they often even find the words that are spoken to be like less credible, essentially. And this is particularly problematic in legal settings. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, all of what you said, I think is right. So, you know, one thing just to say is that when you hear a less familiar dialect or accent, it is probably harder to understand. And it is harder to understand at first, right? But one thing is that people can accommodate pretty quickly. So, you know, after say a minute of somebody talking, you can, you know, you can figure it out and do pretty well. Um, But the difference is, you know, there's these studies where you take the same speaker. So I'll give one example, Um, not my research, but, um, you know, a linguist who studied um, somebody who had a Korean accent in English. And she interacted with um, with a bunch of naive participants. And some of them on this other measure of prejudice that they'd taken beforehand scored kind of high on feeling negative towards uh, Korean American people. And a different group didn't. Uh, these were white English speaking, monolingual English speaking people. Um, and what they found was when the same person was interacting with people who had less prejudice, the communication just went a lot better. And so people asked follow up questions, you know, she was trying to convey the certain amount of information. For clarity. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, she was absolutely able to communicate everything that she intended yeah. to. Um, and so, communication is this two way street. Um, you know, the other thing that you raised was this question about credibility, which I think, you know, trust and credibility are just important for so many aspects of our lives. Um, You know, so in some of my studies, I found that really early on, kids seem to kind of trust information provided by native accented speakers. And uh, there's some research with adults. Um, Some of this was done by my colleague, Boaz Kazar at the University of Chicago, um, who would play adults clips of really simple facts. And so things that you wouldn't necessarily know. So like, how long does a bear sleep on average? You're like, I don't know. And then somebody tells you it's 11 hours. A bear sleeps 11 hours a day. Okay, so you don't really know. But the question is, did you hear that person present the information in a native accent or a non-native accent? And so people are more likely to think that the bear speaks for 11 hours when they heard it presented by um, a non-native speaker. Sorry, when they heard it presented by a native speaker. Um, And so, 
you know, it, it's so that's really subtle and it kind of doesn't matter how long um, a bear sleeps. I mean, I'm sure it matters to somebody, but it doesn't matter to me. Right. Um, and uh, but imagine then you're in a courtroom and somebody's a witness um, and, you know, all over the globe, there's examples of people speaking what's considered to be a non-standard um, or, uh, you know, a less prestigious dialect who then, you know, aren't likely given the same amount of justice that uh, somebody else would be. One of the, to give a spe specific example of what you're talking about here, one of the most famous examples of this occurred in the Trayvon Martin case, uh, where there was a key witness that was called to the stand uh, who spoke in a manner that the jurors perceived as not being educated fundamentally. Um, I believe that she spoke using African-American vernacular English. They said in uh, after the, the court case was over, when the jurors were talked to after, they didn't spend a lot of time talking about the evidence that this person brought. They didn't really spend much time deliberating over what they said. Um, and they just kind of generally referred to it as kind of like hard to get a sense for. And that's like a very, very real life example of what you're speaking to here. I think you said that you explained that, you know, really well. And you can imagine that, you know, in that case, but in so many others that might happen more, you know, even in more subtle ways that somebody just sounds slightly less credible, less authoritative to you. And then that can impact people's implicit judgments and then their explicit decisions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or youngest, however you want to put it, maybe <laughs> uh, parts of the brain. Yeah. And so, yeah, what can people do practically yeah. if they want mm -hmm. to start working with some of these tendencies, yeah. which feel just like so attached mm -hmm. to our nature as human animals? Yeah. Well, you know, I think conversations like this are really important. So, you know, thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for engaging. <laughs> well, thanks for doing yeah. it. But, yeah. But you totally. know, I think that you're right that it just kind we just don't think about it, right? And so we don't think about language in this way. We don't realize the amount of prejudice that we might have against somebody who doesn't speak in the way that we see as, you know, the right way to speak. Um, and we're also not thinking about how that can really impact, that can impact people and their lives. And so, you know, people who speak in a non-native language or um, a dialect that they think that other people don't like, you can feel this real sense of anxiety that your communication is going to be discounted um, and that that's really hard. And so, you know, I think that if you're somebody who feels like you've had that experience, knowing that you're not crazy, like, that, you know, that that's, that's a real facet of human interactions. Um, I think that that's probably helpful. And I think if you speak in a way that's considered, you know, uh, privileged or high status to kind of be aware of that difference and how people can be treated in uh, in their lives. You know, I kind of think about. Um, I think there's a lot, and maybe we'll maybe I'll get to this, but you know, the benefits of multilingual exposure I think are really great. But I really feel like it kind of goes hand in hand with lessening linguistic prejudice. That we're often so prejudiced against people who speak in a different way, and I think in the U.S. in particular, very wary about multilingualism, um, which has a historic, uh, you know, a, a long-standing history of kind of this uh, preference for English over other languages, and even sometimes a very a nervousness about people speaking um, another language. Just a little, yeah. You know, there's this Pew Research poll, uh, I think in 2019, where it was something like 29% of Americans said they would feel bothered hearing a language other than English in a public space. Um, so, you know, there's this, this lingering, you know, anxiety about different languages. And I think that trying to diminish that will do a lot 
towards increasing uh, our abilities to teach multiple languages, say, to kids in schools um, and to see the advantages of multilingualism. So focusing on, as you said, multilingualism for a second here as, as both a good thing for people and a really fascinating, plausible intervention for kind of society more broadly here, um, like how does, how does that change how we perceive language? Or maybe to put it a little bit more cleanly, uh, do, do people who are raised in multilingual environments have fewer of these issues with extreme prejudice against these different groups? Yeah. So it's hard to, you know, draw these big generalizations. And there's plenty of places in the world where there's, you know, a lot of war and a lot of multilingualism, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, it's going to be the perfect solution. Um, but I do think that being exposed to multiple languages is something that gives people additional perspective in the world. Um, you know, so uh, if you're a kid in a monolingual environment, um, and I will note that that's the minority of children in the world, that it feels maybe very common um, to people in, you know, some places, including many parts of the US, but actually a majority of the world's children grow up hearing multiple languages. Um, so if you're raised in this environment where you're hearing multiple languages, kids are really good at responding with what researchers call interlocutor sensitivity. So it's like if I hear English and Spanish and then I meet somebody and they, you know, they start speaking in English or Spanish, kids, even toddlers just instantly kind of know which context they're in. Um, and so if you think about these, what these kids are doing is they're keeping track of, they're not just learning two languages, but they're also keeping track of things like who speaks what to whom, where do we speak this language, who understands what content, right? So maybe I speak this way with mom, but then with, you know, dad and grandma, I do this other thing. And so um, it's this dramatic social training in linguistic perspective taking. And I think that plays out into other aspects of kids' lives and their ability to take the perspective of people more generally. So you're obviously an advocate for people learning languages, particularly people learning languages when they're young. Um, are there any pilot programs, anything that's trying to kind of like take this more out into the world? And are there early results that we've seen from people trying some of these interventions? So, I mean, there's a number, you know, I'm, I'll just limit. So there's a number of places in the world where kids have all sorts of multilingual um, exposure in home, in classrooms, exploratory programs where, you know, a number of languages are spoken, but kids are taught in their native language or dialect, you know, at first, and then they learn other languages and so forth. Um, you know, and then even in the U.S., there's a number of places where kids have bilingual or dual, Im or dual immersion schools. Um, what I would say is that if you look at stats of, say, like how many, you know, uh, public schools in the U.S. teach foreign languages, um, it's really small early on, you know, more so in high school. But even then, you know, in middle school or high school, it's um, it's it's not as good as doing it earlier. Right. You know, again, I don't want to discourage uh, teenagers from taking languages. Um but it's not as good as early on. And I think what we really need is a shift in how we think about language learning that I think often we think about it as kind of like icing on the cake. So it's sort of like, well, I want my kid to learn the real school stuff. Like they need to know math and reading and, you know, whatever other subjects you care about. And then maybe once you have that, you kind of think of language as this like extracurricular add-on. Um, whereas I think language learning can and, you know, could be really seen as a fundamental aspect of what schools can do for kids. Mm. So to kind of situate this culturally, uh, because obviously I'm from the United States and uh, that's probably about 60% of the podcast listening audience, but about 40% is overseas. Uh, so to give people kind of a sense, I was, I'm 33 years old, so I was born in 1987. The first opportunity that I had to learn a not English language was in middle school, uh, really in seventh grade was kind of the first time that you can pick. And I had two languages to, to pick from. I had uh, Spanish and French, which is in the United States pretty common. Those are like two of the languages that get taught more frequently. Um, but it wasn't a requirement. I didn't have to. And so the first time that I actually personally ever took a language class was in high school. And even at that point, there was a def there were some definite limitations in terms of my ability to like achieve comfort, um, certainly achieve fluency, uh, but even just speak the language in a way where it felt like it was being integrated into either my sense of self, my perception of other people, any of the good stuff that you're naming here. 
Yeah. And I think your experience is probably fairly typical, although there's also plenty yeah. of American kids who don't even have that opportunity to take a language in yeah. high school. Um, yeah. I think I was yeah. on the more, the more advantaged yeah. side yeah. in terms of those mm -hmm. things for sure. Moving from the kind of bilinguality part of the conversation to just in general, what can help people become more skillful in their communications with each other? Because you focused a lot of the, the content of the book and a lot of the content of your work in general in learning about the influence of these different dialects. Um, and we sort of spent a second there talking about what people can do to become a more uh, fair perceiver of other people's dialects. But even just in conversation more broadly, whether somebody shares your dialect or not, are there major things that you find in people who tend to be like more effective communicators than people who aren't? I mean, I think one major thing is being an effective listener. And so, you know, we think so much of our communication skills and what we're producing, but, you know, going back to that example, by being an effective listener, you allow the person across from you or, you know, over the computer from you in our, in our current world and right now, right, um, to more effectively communicate with you. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, I think it may be especially important in um, when we're having these virtual interactions that, you know, particularly if you're engaging with somebody who's, who's speaking, say, in a non-native language, it's hard to do that virtually, that often people rely a lot on nonverbal cues, um, gestures, and so forth. And so that's all kind of stripped down. So I think that, you know, giving people the time and space to talk and asking follow-up questions and trying to listen rather than kind of shutting down if you think somebody's not doing a good job communicating. I think those effective listening skills are a really uh, good marker of effective communicators. One of the things that I really love asking people who are doing actively participating in the creation of like the body of knowledge in a in a particular territory which is clearly what you're doing these days is getting a feel from them about where we're going with any of this are there current questions that you're exploring things you're thinking about or curious about like what do you think some of the next big questions or answers maybe to put it a better way that we're looking for here are I love this. Um, you know, there's so many questions and, you know, in some ways I wrote, I wrote this book, um, because my research is, uh, my research is in psychology. So I'm a developmental and, you know, sort of social psychologist. Um, but so much of the research that I drew on in the book is from other disciplines, because I would say that psychologists often kind of make the same uh, mistake in some ways that the public does, and that psychologists, social psychologists often don't think about language in this uh, social category kind of way either. But, you know, if you look at linguistics and anthropology, um, some sociology, you start to see uh, how much language matters for social lives. Um, you know, so I think that for me, at least, I think that a lot of the upcoming questions are really going to be interdisciplinary in nature um, and the methods are going to be importantly interdisciplinary. Um, so, you know, I think that there's questions at the intersection with education, as you mentioned. And so, you know, what are the best ways to, um, to change, you know, what are teachers and kids and parents' attitudes around speakers of different groups, right? And then how does that map on to their language learning? Um, I think that there's questions, um, you know, one thing that I've become interested in is about the link between people's thinking about nationality and their thinking about language. So probably not a huge, you know, <laughs> surprise to you, right, after this conversation and reading the book, but kids often associate, say, American kids uh, speaking English with being being American, seeing that as this really important aspect of national group. Um, and, you know, thinking more about the ways in which our developing, you know, feelings of identity map on to language. Um, I think that there's a lot of open space also in this question about, you know, how do we think about uh, the development of racial attitudes, the intersection of racial attitudes with linguistic prejudice? Um, and, you know, how does that play out in schools? And it might be, you know, using techniques and methods, uh, both from psychology and from linguistics, and also looking at, you know, as you were kind of interested in this question about what interventions might be effective, I think that that is something that people are really going to orient towards as well. So you don't have to be married to this answer, no <laughs> pressure. But we've been 
talking a lot about uh, this conversation has naturally wandered into a lot of social stuff, a lot of social commentary, uh, the way in which people in very large groups relate to each other or don't relate to each other effectively. And of course, large groups are made up of individuals. So a lot of what we're looking at doing is how can we change behavior on an individual level to trickle up, if you will, uh, into our society mm -hmm. more broadly. That's often a hard so direction if, to go in though, unfortunately, yeah, it's right? A tough, it's a, it's it's a tough like direction to go. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. society trickling down to the individuals is just a better way. <laughs> It is a it is a much larger megaphone that you're speaking into to communicate that message to kind of put it that way. Uh, when you're trying to change it on the individual level, it's a small megaphone. So speaking to that, if you could just move out one intervention into society over the next eight months, and it was going to get a fair crack. It might not work, but it was going to get a fair crack. Like, what would it be? So I guess. I would um, have a linguistic diversity lesson for all kids in all schools, right? And this would include learning about different languages and where they came from. And so part of that is about lessening linguistic prejudice, say where you think that one way of speaking is correct and one way isn't. And part of that would be actually learning other languages um, besides just English. And I would add to that, there are a number of kids in schools in the U.S. who come into school not speaking English. And so part of this would also be giving those kids support in learning ling English and in maintaining uh, their home language. And so, you know, it would be about uh, linguistic diversity and resilience. Um, and that would be that would be my addition. <laughs> I think it's a great addition. It's a great <laughs> idea. I totally co-sign it. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to pull the presidential commission together tomorrow, but we'll do our best. <laughs> it's good. totally something to shoot. <laughs> totally something to shoot for here. No, I mean, one of the things that seems so clearly near and dear to your heart inside of this word work broadly is kids and the influence that you can have um, starting at a young age. Are there is there a particular moment in time that you think it's really important to start? talking about these things with kids, to start getting them into a language class if you want to do that, just developmentally? So, you know, I think that, um, I I do think there's all these interesting questions about developmental trajectories and timing, um, you know, and we could break it down by kids learning languages at slightly different ages and what are the outcomes. Um, for, you know, for any parents listening, one thing that I think is important to realize is that you know, parenting is complex. And so I don't think there's like, a, you know, you have to be age two. And if you're two and a half, it's too late, right? So I just don't want, you know, parents to freak out about that because there's so many other things, of course, to freak out about. Um, but, but I think earlier is better. And I think often kids are capable of having complicated conversations earlier than you might think that they are. And I think we've learned a lot about that, right? When we think about politics, when we think about racial justice, that the idea of just kind of not talking about it with kids and hoping it gets brushed under the rug, that they're learning things at school and on the playground and everywhere else. And so, you know, having uh, having conversations with kids and, you know, back to the idea of highlighting the, you know, external structural uh, factors that, uh, that cause inequalities um, over the individual factors, you know, that I think that that's something that's really important. It's a great idea, I think, to kind of close our conversation today with. It, it's an awesome point, Catherine. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this today. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure to speak with you. So today, I had a great time speaking with Dr. Catherine Kinsler. She's a professor at the University of Chicago and the author of the wonderful book, How You Say It. We focused on language and particularly how language can shape our identity, both our own identity and our perception of other people's. And alongside that, how language can be a vehicle for the many judgments and prejudices that people have about different kinds of social groups. As Catherine explained in the early part of the conversation, the brain really cares about language. And it even really cares not only about whether you're speaking English or Spanish or French or Chinese or Japanese or something else entirely, but about whether you're doing it with a certain kind of accent that reveals not only things about you, but very importantly, 
who was speaking to you when you were a younger person. And this can give a lot of insight into the social environment that you were raised in. That way that you speak, the dialect that you use to communicate in can move you into an in-group or an out-group, a group of people that we refer to as like me or one that feels not like me. And these different groups, not only of people, but of things out in the world, govern and impact so much of our cognition. The brain is a category machine, and while this is a really efficient tool for the brain, it saves us a lot of energy to just sort things, including people, into different categories. It also creates a lot of our biases, and the biases we have against different groups and the cognitive biases that can impact the way that we think about the world. A key aspect of Catherine's work is the impact and importance of early language development. Kids really attach to dialect. They care about how the people around them are speaking a lot. And there's some evidence that they might actually care about dialect even more than they care about visual displays of race or ethnic background. And while kids tend to think about dialect as being very fixed, in other words, they assume that if somebody speaks a certain way that they're going to speak that way for the whole rest of their life, research has really shown that people change the way that they talk as their social identity changes. As they move from one group to another, they tend to start to adopt aspects of the speaking style of that group. Sometimes this is done consciously, but much of the time it's a completely unconscious process. In the second half of the conversation, we really moved into talking about prejudice and the ways in which our prejudice against different dialects, different groups of language speakers, can really impact the way that we think. Again, much of this is indeed unconscious, but as Catherine highlighted, sometimes it's really hard to tell if it's unconscious or if it's just really easy to excuse for a person because we don't think about language as being a source of these biases in the same way that we're tuned to bias against people who, say, look a certain kind of way or have a certain kind of gender identity. This makes linguistic biases and linguistic prejudice kind of slippery. It's sort of hard to really pin down when somebody is being prejudiced inside of their preference for one linguistic group or another. But the consequences of this are not vague or uncertain or hard to pin down. They are incredibly granular and they are often extremely harmful and very apparent. I gave the example of somebody speaking in a legal environment where their words are not taken as seriously as the words of other people because they are perceived as being unintelligent or unreliable because they just speak with a different dialect than the other people in the room. That is both incredibly unfair and often overtly racist. Then we close the conversation with some of the things that we can do about all of this. And Catherine really highlighted two things. Well, three things, really. The first one was we can be aware of it. We can start to notice the ways in which we might have preferences for one group of speakers versus another and start to unpack the reasons that might underpin this. Second, we can become better listeners ourselves. Good communicators are often really great listeners. And often we think about communication as being a vehicle for getting our meaning into other people, essentially. But in order to be an effective participant in a conversation, you have to spend at least as much time listening as you do talking. Then finally, we can look for ways that we can impact these issues more socially. As we said toward the end of the conversation, when you try to focus on the level of the individual and have that way trickle up into the rest of society, man, you're using a very small megaphone to make that communication. But when you start at a social level, social structures of different kinds, and you work your way down toward the individual, that tends to be a lot more effective. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Professor Katherine Kinsler. Again, she's the author of How You Say It, Why You Talk the Way You Do, and What It Says About You. If you're interested in learning more about How You Say It, I've included a link to it in the description of today's podcast. If you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to it through the platform of your choice and maybe even leave a comment, a rating, a positive review. It really does help us out. You can also, hey, tell other people about the podcast. It's one of the best ways we have to reach new people. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple cups of coffee a month, you can support the show and you'll receive a bunch of bonuses in return.
Also, you can find us on all the social media outlets. I'm on Instagram as at f.hansen. Uh, we're on Instagram as well at Being Well Podcast. Rick has an Instagram account. We both have Facebook accounts. We're pretty easy to find on all of the various platforms. Until next time, thanks for supporting the show and thanks for listening to this episode. Talk to you soon.